committee will come to order. We will resume questioning the witness under the five-minute rule, Mr. McClintock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Mr. Whitaker, I'm sure you'd agree that the appearance of uh, favoritism or partisanship by law enforcement agencies is absolutely deadly to a nation that's founded upon the principle of equal justice under law. If uh, law enforcement agencies are perceived to be biased or partisan, I think faith in them can, and in our system of justice, can quickly collapse. And I am concerned about many alarming developments in the conduct of the FBI and the Department of Justice uh, that, that call its impartiality into, into question. I've been reading uh, Greg Jarrett's book on the Comey investigation into the Clinton emails and the Uranium One deal and the Mueller investigation into the Trump campaign. And in it, uh, Mr. Jarrett meticulously documents case after case of political bias by the FBI, of illegal conduct at the highest levels of the Department of Justice, uh, destruction of evidence, uh, possible obstruction of justice by Mr. Comey himself, uh, perjury by top DOJ officials, um, prosecute, uh, prosecutorial misconduct uh, and political bias throughout Mueller's team, now, if the Russia investigation was initiated because of a patently false dossier, why aren't we seeing an equally aggressive investigation into these very meticulously documented charges? Congressman, as you mentioned at the beginning, we do conduct our investigations independent of political interference at the Department of Justice. Um, the that, that, that's not uh, the, what let the, me finish, let me the finish preponderance the of evidence is telling me from, from uh, sources such as this, uh, this one. Well, and, and specifically related to the document you just described, that is the subject of an inspector general's review uh, investigation together with the uh, U.S. attorney from the District of Utah that was appointed by General Sessions to look into and review certain matters that this committee had uh, asked be reviewed. Can we expect a full, complete, and aggressive investigation of, of uh, charges of wrongdoing by uh, uh, officials in the FBI and the Department of Justice on these matters? Congressman, I can assure you that any allegation of misconduct by an employee of the Department of Justice will be looked into um, thoroughly. Well, I think back to the uh, Lois Lerner scandal, and that never was addressed. Why, why should I be more confident in your assurances now? Congressman, I was a private citizen when the Lois Lerner uh, situation occurred. In fact, it occurred mostly under the previous administration. I know that General Sessions did a review of that matter um, before I was Chief of Staff, so I really don't have any visibility as I sit here today as Acting Attorney General as to what happened in that situation. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, talk about the, the apparent double standard and disproportionate show of force in cases like the arrest of, of Roger Stone. As I understand it, uh, Stone's attorneys were in constant contact with the Department of Justice. He's 66 years old, doesn't own any firearms, and yet he was the subject of a pre-dawn raid by 29 combat armed officers. As Mr. Uh, uh, Jordan has pointed out, CNN was obviously tipped off to have cameras there. And in fact, they arrived to set up before the raid began. They were allowed to stay to, to film the entire spectacle, despite the fact the public was kept out, ostensibly because the FBI was so concerned of violence by the 66-year-old unarmed man in, in this pre-dawn raid. Uh, and you compare that to cases like uh, uh, Bob Menendez, who was allowed to quietly turn himself in. The, the obvious explanation uh, is that this was a political act whose purpose was to terrify anyone thinking of working in the Trump campaign in the future. And again, it harkens back to the conduct of the IRS, terrifying rank and file Tea Party members with tax audits because of their political views. How do you explain this and, and, and what are you doing about it? Congressman, this is a very serious situation that you raise, but just know that the FBI makes arrests in a manner most likely to ensure the safety of its agents and of the person being arrested. The FBI must also consider well, well, the safety of the surrounding how do you How do you explain the discrepancy between the way Roger Stone was treated and the way Bob Menendez was treated? Again, the example. arrest team has to consider numerous factors in making the judgment as to do how to conduct the operation. Do you at least understand the appearance of impropriety that that projects to the country and undermines the uh, uh, faith that the American people have in their justice system and in its detachment from politics? Congressman, I cannot provide the details in this opening. 
without revealing what factors the FBI considers in those decisions. And obviously that information could be used to put other FBI agents conducting other operations in harm's way. What I can assure you, Congressman, is that the FBI is prepared to brief this matter on the decisions that were made in that particular arrest in a closed session of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Whitaker, the DOJ was created in <clears throat> 1957 under the Civil Rights Act, correct? Um, Congressman, uh, well, I it, believe, it, I believe uh, it President was. Grant signed the Department of Justice. No, 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 no. It, it was. We're just not going to do all this late stuff. It was. And it was, it was created to protect against discrimination based on rec race, color, sex, disability, religion, familial status, and national origin. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, you're talking about the Civil Rights Division specifically? No, DOJ. The Department of Justice was uh, set up to... What? You know what? Never mind. To... Let's keep going. <clears throat> you were chief of staff when uh, Jeff Sessions testified in this committee in 2017, correct? November. Uh, I was, and in fact, I sat right behind him. Right. There. That's exactly where I'm going. Because do you remember me asking him a question about diversity and leadership at DOJ and the fact that they had no African Americans in leadership at DOJ? Do you have any African Americans at the top leadership in the Department of Justice? If the Senate confirms my friend Don Washington to be head of the U.S. Marshals, uh, which I believe he is pending on the floor of, of, of the Senate currently, then the answer to that question would be yes. But as we sit here today, I do not believe. But it, what, do you, what do you consider the leadership of the Department of Justice? The hierarchy with people uh, responding to them, head of a division, deputy, uh, attorney generals, if you look at the flow chart, the upper <clears throat> echelon. So think about the image to me, DOJ created to protect civil rights and advocate for all. We've had the last two attorney generals come here, not one of them thought they could find or did find an African American at DOJ to bring with them. And you're charged with enforcing civil rights and making people feel that you're fighting for equality. You mentioned Charlottesville and charging the person uh, with 30 counts, and I applaud you for that. Uh, do you believe that in Charlottesville there were good people on both sides? Um, Congressman, I think the act, uh, while it's part, you know, again, a part of an ongoing prosecution, but, I can tell no, you. No, let me just say this. The act was charged as a hate crime. I, I agree I with you, and I, I applaud you. Act. I applaud you for that. But that's the one individual. I'm asking you in general, do you believe that there were good people that were protesting and there were good people that were anti-protesters? So I'm talking about the people Congress marching with light, I mean, uh, uh, the tiki torches and the chants. Do you think that some of them were good people is the short question. Congressman, there is no place in a civil society for hate, for white supremacy, or for white nationalism. Thank you. Uh, also, out of the 115,000 employees that you have at DOJ, are any of them transgender? Uh, Congressman, as I sit here today, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I can imagine that generally, based on the way the population is distributed, that we would. I would also be happy to get back to you that answer if those people identify that way. Would you have a problem with a transgender person being from a clerk to a agent in the field for any of your law enforcement agencies? No. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned also that voter fraud is of a serious concern. How many voter fraud cases have you all initiated? Congressman, as I, as I mentioned in previous questioning, I'm happy to get those specific details uh, back to you. Um, as I sit here today, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Is it a lot? Is it a few? I mean, if we're talking about a serious concern in the United States of America, I would think we're talking over 100, or we're talking less than 25. Just, but if you don't know ballpark, I'm fine with that. Um, what about North Carolina? Because that is the only congressional seat that has not been determined because of widespread voter suppression in that race. Uh, is the DOJ, have they? opened an investigation in that? And if they have, I guess you can't talk about it. 
Congressman, are you looking at that? Well, I can't talk about open investigations, and, and I appreciate your acknowledging that there might be open investigations. I am very aware of what is happening in North Carolina. We have previously done uh, voting rights uh, cases in North Carolina, and we're watching that situation very carefully. Well, I don't want to go over my time, and I guess in the last 12 seconds, I will just implore you to implore, which will now be the third attorney general during this term, that after two years, uh, we should be doing better with diversity in the Department of Justice, and I'm talking more specifically black and brown people and women. I applaud you for having one woman with you, but the DOJ should look like the country. And you all have been here twice, and it is not a fair representation of what makes this country great. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Mr. Klein. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ms. Lesko. Thank you. Um, you know, I have to say that I'm very disappointed in hearing. Uh, you know, I, I ran for Congress to get things done. And um, at the beginning of this, you know, we were told that this is about asking about DOJ oversight and some legitimate questions. And here we are, it's nothing but character assassination, harassment um, of, of our witness, and it's really disappointing. At first I was mad, I have to tell you, when this thing started hours ago, I went outside and a reporter asked me, what do you think of the hearing? And I said, it's a joke. Um, but, but now I'm just sad. I'm sad because we were on the floor just a, a little while ago um, talking about um, how we are honoring our late uh, Representative Dingle and talking about bipartisanship and how we need to get things done. And yet here we are with a blatant uh, political show that doesn't help anything. I imagine if American people are watching this right now, they'd be shaking their heads. Like, what are you doing there? We need to work together to get things done. And so that's my statement, but I do have a question for, for um, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, about DOJ oversight. Um, following the New York Governor Cuomo's support of abortion up to the moment of birth, and Governor Northam of Virginia's comments indicating support of an action which, in my opinion, uh, relates to infanticide, um, are you concerned about some of these actions of late that implicate the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act that criminalizes gruesome procedures. I mean, I, I'm getting really concerned that this is violating the law, and has DOJ looked into this? Yes, as an American citizen, I am very concerned. And can you also tell me, um, I, I read recently a Wall Street Journal opinion piece. It was from 2018, and in that it said New York City, in New York City, thousands of more black babies are aborted than born alive each year, and my grandkids are African American. And so, you know, if there was a crime occurring in this country that exceeded the number of deaths of, from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, accidents combined, which abortions do, um, is that something that the DOJ would get involved in and be concerned about and try to stop? Congresswoman, every life is valuable. And I, I, while I can't wade into the political issue that you raise, uh, the members of this committee have a lot of power as to how we value life and, and how we enforce the laws at the Department of Justice. And this is an issue that I know there, are, there is a lot of passion about, and I appreciate your passion, and it's something that we actually share together. And if you look at my statements uh, previous to joining the Department of Justice, uh, especially during the 2014 campaign for the United States Senate, I was very outspoken in this regard. But it's, it's, as I sit here as Acting Attorney General, I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment more fulsomely on this issue, but we're going to enforce the laws that Congress passes, and we're going to hold those accountable um, that violate the law. Thank you. I yield back my time. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, thank you for your presence here today. This hearing is important because there are many Americans throughout the country who are confused. I'm confused. I really am. We're all trying to figure out who are you, where did you come from, and how the heck did you become the head of the Department of Justice? So hopefully you can help me work through this confusion. All right, well, I'm, I mean, Congressman, not... I, I, Mr. Whitaker, that was a statement, not a question. Okay. I assume you know the difference. The investigation in the possible Trump-Russia collusion in the 2016 election has resulted in 37 indictments. Is that correct? I believe that number is correct, but most of those folks were um, Russian citizens. 34 individuals have been indicted, true? Um, while I haven't counted those as I prepared for my hearing preparation, I believe those are consistent with the numbers that I, as I know them. Three corporate entities have been indicted, correct? I believe so, correct. The investigation has identified 199 different criminal acts, true? I haven't counted every indictment, but that sounds consistent with what I understand. There have been seven guilty pleas, correct? Yes, there have been seven guilty pleas. Four people have already been sentenced to prison. True? Uh, I believe so, but I, again, I do not have this information in front of me. So um, to the extent that you know, I, I disagree with you, because these are facts. Understood. Thank you. Trump's best friend, Roger Stone, was recently indicted for lying to Congress in connection with his possible involvement with WikiLeaks and Russian interference with the 2016 election, correct? Yes, and I mentioned Mr. Stone's indictment and arrest. Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, pled guilty to conspiracy to defraud the United States, true? Mr. Manafort did plead guilty, yes. Trump's deputy campaign manager, Rick Gates, has pled guilty to lying to the FBI, correct? While I don't have the indictment in front of me, I have no reason to disagree with you. Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, has pled guilty to lying to the FBI, correct? That is a true fact, yes. Trump's longtime personal attorney and consigliere, Michael Cohen, pled guilty to lying to Congress about the Trump real estate organization's Moscow project. Is that true? I, I believe that was one of the bases for his uh, plea agreement. I actually, there were several other reasons that Mr. Cohen plead guilty. Plead guilty. Trump, Trump's campaign foreign policy advisor, George Papadopoulos, has pled guilty to lying to federal investigators about his contacts with Russian agents during the 2016 campaign. True? While I'm sure there are many who would disagree with that title that you put on Mr. Papadopoulos, it is true that he has pled guilty, yes. So despite all of the evidence of criminal wrongdoing that has been uncovered, do you still believe that the Mueller investigation is a lynch mob? Um, Congressman, can you tell me specifically where I said that? I'd be happy to. So in a tweet uh, that you issued on August 6th of 2017, you made reference to uh, a note to Trump's lawyer, do not cooperate with Mueller's lynch mob. You recall that? Um, I recall that I said uh, that I retweeted an article um, that, was, that was titled that. Um, I did not necessarily agree with this, that position, but my point was that it was an interesting read for those that want to understand the situation. Okay, reclaiming my time. Manafort, Gates, Flynn, Cohen, Papandopoulos, and Stone are all in deep trouble. One by one, all of the president's men are going down in flames. It's often said where there's smoke, there's fire, there's a lot of smoke emanating from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now. Yet, you decided not to recuse yourself, is that right? Uh, Congressman, the decision to recuse was my decision to make. I looked at all of the information, I consulted with uh, many people uh, that I've discussed today, and I determined that it was not necessary for me to recuse. And Donald Trump considered the Sessions recusal to be a betrayal, is that right? Uh, Congressman, I have no idea as I sit here today what the President believed about General Sessions recusal. Okay, so let's be clear. The investigation into Russia's attack on our democracy is not a witch hunt, it's not a fishing expedition, it's not a hoax, it's not a lynch mob, it's a national 
security imperative. The fact that people suggest otherwise comes dangerously close to providing aid and comfort to the enemy in your final week. Keep your hands off the Mueller investigation. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Attorney General. I was hopeful that we would get into some oversight over the array of areas of the Department of Justice that are so critical and so important to addressing the problems that are facing my community, drugs, crime, uh, all of these issues are of top concern to my constituents. And uh, one of the most important things that I hear about when I get back to my district is, uh, are you going to keep the government operating? Uh, can you reach an agreement on immigration issues? So when we talk about immigration, uh, I can ask you uh, a couple of questions that would probably help get to an immigration agreement. Um, the backlog of pending cases in immigration courts nationwide have been growing exponentially since 2008 from fewer than 200,000 cases in 2008 to more than 800,000. And Border Patrol is currently apprehending almost 50,000 aliens each month, a certain percentage of which ends up in that same pending case backlog. And in the face of this backlog, what steps is DOJ taking to ensure that its immigration judges can efficiently and effectively adjudicate cases and reduce this backlog of pending cases in a fair and efficient manner? Thank you, Congressman. This is an important issue to the Department of Justice, and our immigration judges work hard every day to adjudicate those cases. But quite frankly, the number of immigration judges we have has have been overwhelmed by the number of asylum seekers. Um, all, over 80 percent, and really over 90 percent, of those that are encountered at the border and, and detained and arrested uh, claim some form of asylum. Ultimately, that causes those folks to be put into the immigration court system, and then uh, requires that a hearing be held by an immigration judge. Um, and meanwhile, most of these folks, those 800,000 that are pending, uh, are not part of the detained docket. They are part of the um, released um, docket. And those cases take longer, uh, the, the ones that are not detained, the non-detained docket. And uh, they have caused, since 2008, that number to go dramatically up. What we have done about that situation is General Sessions and I have, um, have issued Attorney General orders, uh, changing some of the specifics as to how those cases are adjudicated. And in addition, we have, together with the help of Congress, which you've authorized and funded more immigration judges, we have put a dramatic uh, number of more judges, uh, especially to the areas where it's needed, which okay. is oftentimes at the border. So you've also put in place an additional performance metric to gauge the performance of judges working to complete cases and reduce the backlog. Um, are those working? And you've gotten pushback from groups who are concerned that they amount to case quotas. Um, and if they are working, are you aware of any organization in which productivity of its workers isn't assessed as one part of a multidimensional performance review? Yes, in fact, government-wide, where there are administrative law judges uh, similar to our immigration judges, there are typically performance metrics that are in place to not only evaluate their productivity, but also to uh, budget and manage uh, that workforce. And what are you doing to uh, ensure that continuances in immigration cases uh, are not abused and are granted solely for good cause? We issued a Attorney General order, uh, which set the standard, um, which had been different based on what the Immigration uh, Appeals Court, uh, which is an internal, the uh, Board of Immigration Appeals, which is an internal DOJ body uh, that the Attorney General sits over. We've passed uh, rules and regulations and, and a new standard for issuing those continuances for good cause, as you mentioned. All right. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I'll now yield to the. Uh, to the gentleman from uh, Rhode Island for the purpose of unanimous consent request.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask unanimous consent that the following uh, articles be placed in the record. The first is an article entitled, Exclusive Trump Loyalist Matthew Whitaker Was Counseling the White House on Investigating Clinton. The second article, Sessions Replacement Matthew Whitaker Called Mueller's Appointment Ridiculous and a Little Fishy. Third article, All the Time Robert Mueller's New Boss Railed Against the Russia Probe. Trump's pick to replace Jeff Sessions once said Mueller investigation risked becoming a witch hunt. And finally, an article entitled, Trump's new acting attorney general once mused about defending Robert Mueller. Without objection, these documents will be placed in the record. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, I'm going to be really straight with you up front. I'm going to cut you off if you make long speeches. We have very limited time. You do not need to thank me for asking the question or compliment me that it's a good one. I'll assume they're all good questions and you're grateful. One, you were briefed by the special counsel. You've acknowledged that. Did you share that information with any members of your staff, the information you learned in that briefing from the special counsel or his team? Congressman, as I previously testified, there was one other individual in that briefing. with. And who is that individual? Um, it is the U.S. Attorney from the Eastern District of California who I've brought on. What, what is the name of the individual, Mr. Whitaker? Uh, his name is Greg Scott. So that's the, did you communicate any information you learned in those briefings to other members of your staff? I don't believe so, no. Do you know whether any information that you learned in those briefings were communicated to anyone at the White House? As I mentioned previously, Congressman, we have kept a very close... Mr. Whitaker, it's a yes or a no. Do you know whether it was communicated to anybody at the White House? As I sit here today, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether it was communicated. Did you, I do did not you put Mr. into Scott place I... any restrictions or limitations or instructions to your staff not to share this information with anyone at the White House or the president's legal team? Yes, together with the general standard that investigative information and materials are need to know and Law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Did, did the president lash out at you after Michael Cohen's guilty plea for lying to Congress about a Trump organization project to build a tower in Moscow? The president specifically tweeted that he had not lashed out. Did, did, I'm asking you, Mr. Whitaker, did the president lash out at you? I'm not asking you what he tweeted. I don't have a lot of confidence in the veracity of his tweets. I'm asking you under oath. Congressman, that is based on an unsubstantiated... Sir, answer the question, um, yes or no. Did the president lash out to you about Mr. Cohen's guilty plea? No, he did not. And did anyone from the White House or anyone on the president's behalf lash out at you? No. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, did the president lash out to you on or about December 8th? 2018 to discuss a case before the Southern District in New York where he was identified as individual one? No, Congressman. Did anyone on the president's behalf, either out, inside the White House or outside the White House, contact you to lash out or express dissatisfaction? Did they contact me to lash out? Yes. Did they reach out to you in some way to express dissatisfaction? No. Okay. Did you uh, share the questions that Mr. Nadler forwarded to you prior to this hearing with anyone at the White House or the President's legal counsel? Um, Congressman, I did not. So when you claimed earlier that you were going to invoke a privilege, you were invoking a privilege about questions the President hasn't even seen. Uh, Congressman, to be clear, I'm not invoking any privilege. Well, you said earlier that you, in your written testimony, that you would not answer questions about your conversations with the President. Did you not? Yes, I did. So you are not sitting here today saying the president has instructed you not to answer a question, correct? I am not sitting here today saying that the president has instructed So then you're prepared to answer all these questions? Congressman, I think I was pretty explicit in my opening statement. So, so have you spoken to the president, Mr. Whitaker, about the Mueller investigation? Congressman, as I have previously testified, uh, I had, did not talk, talk to the president about the Mueller investigation. Have you ever spoken to the president or, members, or parts of his uh, legal team about information that you've learned in your capacity as acting attorney general related to the Mueller investigation or any other criminal investigation involving the president? Congressman, while I have specifically been saying that I'm not going to comment about my conversations with the president or his senior staff, I have also been very clear that the president has not instructed me to do anything. I said that wasn't office. my question. My question is, have you had conversations about what you learned? That's a yes or a no. 
Congressman, I have, I spend all day, every day talking. Mr. Whitaker, my question is very specific. Have you spoken to the president or his legal team about what you've learned in the Mueller investigation or with the related criminal investigations that may involve the president? Yes or no? Congressman, as I specifically answered earlier to a question. Mr. Whitaker, you're clearly not going to answer the question, so I'm going to move on. Uh, per, you know Professor John Barrett, correct? Well, but anyway, he, this is a, a law school professor who tweeted that you told him in June of 2017 that, he was flying, that you were flying out from Iowa to New York City to be on CNN regularly because you were hoping to be noticed as a Trump defendant and through that to get a Trump judicial appointment back in Iowa. You then went on to describe the Mueller appointment of the special counsel as ridiculous and a little fishy, that Mueller investigating Trump's finances would be going too far, that there is no criminal obstruction of justice charge to be had against President Trump, that there was no collusion with the Russians and the Trump campaign, that any candidate would have taken the same meeting as Donald Trump Jr. with a Russian lawyer, and finally, that a replacement for Sessions could reduce Mueller's budget so low that his investigation grinds to almost a halt. You, you said all those things, and they're all in print, and it answers Mr. Deutsch's question. The American people wonder, just how is it that Mr. Whitaker becomes the acting Attorney General of the United States in violation of existing statutes? Was he put there for a particular purpose? That wasn't a question, it's a statement, I yield back. I've observed that. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, who's next? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Thank Reschenthaler you, Mr. Chairman. is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Whitaker, for being here today. I just want to quickly reference the letter that was sent to you from the chair on January 9th. In this letter, in the chairman's own words, it said that this committee was here to, quote unquote, to conduct oversight of the department. In this letter is also important in other topics that were supposed to be discussed here today, like immigration, gun violence, the Violence Against Women's Act, Obamacare, national security, and that's not even the complete list. I know you read the letter. Um, I was excited to be here. I thought these were critically important issues that affected constituents in my district and millions of Americans. And frankly, a lot of these issues are life and death. So I'm really confused as I sit here today in this hearing with my Democrat colleagues focused solely on one topic, and that's the Mueller investigation. I really hope that my friends across the aisle would have used this opportunity for more bipartisanship uh, and less showmanship, but uh, clearly I was wrong. With that said, I want to get to some of the important topics that we were supposed to have focused on today. Uh, one of those is sanctuary cities. In my home state of Pennsylvania, the sanctuary city of Philadelphia has released at least three child molesters back onto the streets. And everyone knows the tragic story of 32-year-old Kate Steinley, who was mur murdered by an illegal immigrant, who was convicted of seven felonies and deported five times. Now, those child molesters in Philadelphia the murder of Kate Steinle, they were all released because some city wanted to score cheap political points. And that's why I'm focused on ending sanctuary cities. Mr. Whitaker, what steps is DOJ taking to end the dangerous practice of sanctuary cities? Well, first of all, we're ending taxpayer-funded grants to sanctuary jurisdictions. The Attorney General Sessions announced new conditions for our burn JAG grants uh, that will increase information sharing between federal, state, and local law enforcement to ensure public safety. I don't know if the Congressman knows this, but one of the challenges we have is in a sanctuary jurisdiction, they, uh, jails will release convicted criminals back into the community instead of informing Immigration Customs Enforcement that the person is available to be picked up at the jail. It is an incredibly dangerous situation to make an ICE officer go into a community to try to arrest somebody that is here illegally and has been convicted of a crime, oftentimes crimes that, like you mentioned, and I, and, I, and, I, and I cannot imagine a situation where a mayor or a city council or a county executive or otherwise would, would put law enforcement officers in harm's way. It is quite frankly um, bad policy and we are going to work very hard to end it and one of the ways we're ending it is by taking away the resources to those jurisdictions that have that policy. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, I have one more question regarding the opioid crisis. Um, this crisis is, is striking our country hard, particularly southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, data from 2017 shows that it is more likely now that someone's going to die of a drug overdose than a car crash. Uh, my district has been hit really hard, in particular Fayette County saw an 88% increase in over death, uh, overdose deaths from 2015 to 2017. 
uh, what steps does the DOJ take to address this shift? And do you think that a lot of the problems that we're seeing in these stats comes from a poor southern border? Uh, to address your second question first, uh, I do believe that most uh, illegal opioids, <laughs> like fentanyl, non-prescription illegal opioids, like fentanyl, uh, heroin, and their derivatives do are imported through our southern border. Some, uh, not a majority, but some are also uh, via direct mail, uh, for example, and ordered off the dark net. Uh, I, I went through a list of things that the Department of Justice is doing to combat this opioid epidemic. I, I hope that this committee, uh, while you know, it's something I was prepared and wanted to talk about, and, I'm, and I appreciate the question, um, will look at other ways that we can put resources into um, the opioid crisis. 70,000 people, as you mentioned, have died of drug overdoses. A majority of those are from some form of opioids. Um, and we also, quite frankly, and I mentioned my trip to China last August, uh, we have to work together with the Chinese government to reduce the inflow of fentanyl. And we also have to, you know, we have emergency scheduled right now the uh, fentanyl analogs, but we need an act of Congress, and I hope that we can get that to make that permanent, that these fentanyl derivatives and, and, and creative chemists that change the chemical makeup um, of fentanyl do not continue to try to evolve their drug to avoid our regulation. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I yield back my time. Thank you. Mr. Whitaker, did your watchdog organization ever receive contributions from foreign donors? Mr. Chairman, point of order. I'd ask the gentleman, to stop the was, clock. Now, gentleman will suspend. The gentleman will state his point of order. My point of order, and I'm going to go back to this, and would again undoubtedly the majority does not care. But this is outside the scope of this hearing. This was not while he was employed here, and whether he outside had donors or not during the time he was not employed, making no connection either way is not inside the scope of this hearing. And that's not the call of this committee. Now, and I, you know, look, I'm I'm outgunned over here. I have the votes. This is not part of the call of the hearing. Mr. Walker, there's plenty of things to do. Ms. Cicilline, you well, can the gentleman on, yield? Uh, Mr. Collins, if no, you want no, to sit no, down no, there with his lawyers, you can go sit gentlemen, down there, but you're not his lawyer. Gentlemen will suspend. And neither are you, Mr. Gentlemen, Swalwell. And if you ask questions that are actually gentlemen. part of this, instead of running for president down there, we could get this gentlemen. done. You can sit down there. There's room. Both gentlemen will suspend. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman has stated a point of order. The chair will rule the point of order is not well taken. The scope of people's questioning, we afford a wide latitude, and we don't even know where it's going at this point. Uh, the gentleman, so the, the gentleman's point of order is, is not well taken. The gentleman will, con, will, will resume. Appeal the ruling of the chair. The, the, the gentleman appealed the ruling of the chair. The gentlelady uh, moved to table. Move to table is not debatable. The clerk will call the roll on the motion to table. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Oh, let's see. Uh, Call the roll. Uh, all in favor of tabling the resolution, I'm sorry, all in favor of tabling the appeal of the ruling of the chair will say aye. 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 Nay. Nay. The ayes have it. The appeal of the, the, the motion is tabled. The gentleman will continue. Mr. Whitaker, does your organization have foreign contributions? Um, just to be clear, are, are you yes talking Yes or about, no. What do you mean by my organization? You led an organization called FACT. Did it receive foreign contributions while you were there? Uh, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. I do not believe as I sit here today that it did, but our main donor uh, was uh, a group that was a U.S. entity. When you, did you interview with Don McGahn in July 2017 to have the job that Ty Cobb would ultimately get? I ultimately did not meet with Mr. McGann, so uh, I met with Did you talk staff. with him on the phone? Uh, you know, we actually never did end up talking on the phone either. Who did you meet with on his staff? Uh, I talked to Annie Donaldson from his staff, who was his chief of staff at the time. And when you talked to Mr. McGann's chief of staff, did you express in that conversation your prior views about the Mueller investigation? No, I did not. In was fact, it brought up by the chief of staff? In fact, at the time, Congressman, um, everyone at the White House did not want to talk about the special counsel's investigation. But you were interviewing for a job that would respond to the special counsel's investigation, is that right? Uh, at the time, I was interviewing for the position that was ultimately occupied by Ty Cobb. But I want to understand how you could was. interview for a job that would respond to the special counsel investigation, but you were not to talk at all about the special counsel investigation. 
How would they know? Well, I, I said we you didn't do. talk about it. I, they, they, they did not want to talk about the investigation because the, the folks were dealing with that investigation, and that's why they wanted to bring in someone that had been unrelated to the investigation in the campaign. Did they talk to you about your prior opinions about the Mueller investigation? No, we did not discuss it. We Has discussed there been about my background as a United States attorney and uh, my legal practice. Has there been discussion uh, at the department about keeping the Mueller report from going to Congress? No, we, in fact, we're continuing to follow the special counsel regulations as it relates to the report. And we, we haven't received the report. Uh, Has but, there been a draft opinion about keeping it from going to Congress? You know, Congressman, I'm not going to talk about the kind of ongoing investigation that is the special counsel. I will sh share with Ms. you that- Mr. Whitaker, did Donald Trump ask you if you would recuse uh, before you became acting attorney general? If that question came up, did he ask you what you would do? Congressman, I've already answered that question in my opening statement. Do you believe Attorney General Sessions should have recused? As I mentioned in my answers previously, the recusal decision- No, do you believe, yes or no, that he should have recused? I, I actually, as I sit here today, I do not have an opinion. I believe he determined it was the, the right decision for him to make, and, and that, so I, I agree that he made the right decision for him. Have there been any discussions at the department about pardons for Paul Manafort, Roger Stone, Michael Flynn, or Michael Cohen? Congressman, we have a very well-worn uh, system. That the president doesn't follow, but have there been discussions about pardons for those individuals that you're aware of, yes or no? Um, Congressman, as I've been an acting attorney general, I have not been involved in any discussions of any pardons, even and, and including the ones you're discussing. You made a public statement last week that the investigation was nearly complete. Uh, is that your characterization or is that Bob Mueller's characterization? Congressman, uh, that position that I mentioned last week in a press conference was uh, my position as acting attorney general. Would Bob Mueller, if sitting before us right now, agree with you? You know, Congressman, Bob Mueller is going to finish his investigation when he wants to finish his investigation. Is Mr. Mueller honest? Congressman, I, I have been on the record about my respect for Bob Mueller and his ability to conduct this investigation. Do you believe he's honest, yes or no? I have no re reason to believe he's not honest, so yes, I do believe he's honest. Do you believe he's conflicted, yes or no? Congressman, as I mentioned uh, regarding recusals, you know, sort of the conflict analysis is for the individual lawyer to make once a matter is before them. And I'm sure that, that whether it's Bob Mueller, whether it's Rod Rosenstein, the president has called him conflicted. The, Justice, the president's called it. him conflicted and you oversee the investigation. Do you believe that Mr. Mueller's conflicted? Congressman, as acting attorney general, I have followed regular order at the Department of Justice, and I have expected that the lawyers and the support staff and agents that work for me follow regular order, and as I sit here today, I don't have any reason to believe that. You, so you don't believe he, you believe he's honest, you don't believe he's conflicted. Can you say right now, Mr. President, Bob Mueller is honest and not conflicted? Congressman, I'm not a puppet to repeat what you're saying. I Are you able answered, to say it, or do you answered, not believe it? I have answered your question as to what I believe about the special counsel. I stand by my prior statement. Can you say it to the president, though? Congressman, I am not here to be a puppet to repeat terms and words that you say that I should say. Can you say that to the president? Regular order. Mr. Chair, he, he hasn't answered that question. Sorry? He has not answered the question if he would say that Mr. Mueller is honest. The time of the gentleman has the expired. President. The witness may answer the question. I don't have anything further to add. I think I've answered the congressman's question. That's a question for observers. The uh, ge uh, gentleman from uh, North Dakota, Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Whitaker, uh, you've obviously been acting attorney general during some fairly interesting times, and we've heard a lot about that today. But I also want to commend the Department of Justice, the FBI, the White House, and all other law enforcement who was involved in the First Step Act. Uh, this is a tremendous shift, not just for the Department of Justice, not just for Republicans, and not just for Democrats. And it's the way government's supposed to work. It's supposed to show um, redemption, tough on traffickers, organized crime, and also work towards um, a smarter way to deliver criminal justice, particularly with addiction-related crimes. So my only hope is that because it is called the First Step Act, there will be a second step, 
And if you ever, unfortunately, I have some other questions for you. So yeah. I, anytime on your way out, if you have any advice on something Congress can do to continue this momentum, I would be very, very appreciative. Well, uh, you know, Congressman, I was involved on behalf of the Department of Justice in the First Step Act. And I just want to commend everyone on this committee that worked on the First Step Act uh, to successfully get that passed and to get it through both the House and the Senate. I actually know how difficult that is. Uh, I think one of the things that we could use your help on is to make sure you fund the First Step Act and, and, and what we've, you've requested the Department of Justice to do. Um, you know, we continue to implement the First Step Act consistent with the law that you passed. And in fact, just last night, we sent out guidance to our U.S. Attorney's offices out of how, how to implement the First Step Act. And I know that the Bureau of Prisons as well is, is, is uh, implementing the act. And I, I would hope to work towards having a federal level pretrial release program to be available to every state and county um, courthouse across the country. Because one of the great ironies I've always found about your pretrial release program is it is incredibly effective and then you get a 10 year minimum mandatory. <laughs> So um, the pretrial release program at the Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's offices across this country is phenomenal, and they deserve to be credited for that. And as a former United States attorney for five and a half years in Des Moines, Iowa, I understand uh, uniquely how uh, pretrial release works. Um, and so I, you know, we'd be interested in your proposal, and we'll look at that and work with you carefully to, to try to implement something like that. Now, in our role as oversight, um, I do actually have a question about something that has come up in the past and that, given the nature of the testimony today, very, very possibly could come up in the future. And I think often when we have names like Clinton and Com Comney and Rosenstein and Trump and Mueller and Russia, we forget that the law is the law. You testified earlier to um, Representative Jordan that we, that we prosecute crimes, not people. And I think often across this country, we think laws apply differently to people depending on their status. And one of the areas where this came up, and it was something that concerned me before I was involved in this, is when we started talking about the difference between gross negligence and intent. And it was in, in a very particular statute, and we were dealing with it, and there were members of the FBI and the DOJ that said that were concerned about vagueness. But as far as I understand in the federal code, particularly the federal criminal code, gross negligence has the same definition approximately everywhere in the criminal code, right? In my experience, your statement is generally correct, yes. So if gross negligence would be vague under one particular statute of the criminal code, then we should be concerned that it's vague under every other criminal, uh, other section of the criminal code. That is correct. And there's, for example, jury instructions that would say, inform a jury as to how to evaluate a gross negligence standard to, to convict someone of a crime. And assuming that it wasn't political in nature as to why gross negligence wasn't looked forward in any particular case. Um, has, under your leadership, under the DOJ, has anybody reviewed this, looked at it, and made any proposals to Congress, um, particularly regarding whether or not we need to tighten up gross negligence language, not just, let's say, in the Espionage Act, but in any section of the federal criminal code? Um, as I sit here right now, I don't know uh, the answer to your question, but I'd be happy to get back to you on that. I'd, I'd appreciate that. And then I'm just, again, under normal course of order, I'm assuming it works the same as everywhere. Proce or law enforcement agents, and I know a lot of FBI agents actually do have law degrees, but FBI agents proce or investigate crimes, and then it goes up the food team to the U.S. Attorney's Office, but usually, maybe... And remember, I mean, you, you, need a, you need a predication to even open an investigation, and that's the step that I think a lot of people forget. I mean, there's many steps along the way, and when you conduct a criminal investigation, first you have to predicate the investigation, uh, then it's, it's investigated by the, the, eight, the special agents that investigate the crimes. T typically, an AUSA is, works with them to get you know, search warrants and the like, and then ultimately a case is developed and presented to a grand jury and that is charged. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, typical. And then, and then again, uh, there's a discovery process and a, and a trial process. It's a very, very well-worn. And, uh, and to, you know, go back to something you mentioned earlier, Congressman, uh, all of that is done at the Department of Justice without interference, improper interference or interference uh, based on a political nature. Well, I'm just concerned moving forward that we have the same, I mean, everybody knows, I, and 
Obviously, this is hypertension and hyperpolitical, but I'm very concerned moving forward that everybody knows what the rules of the game are as far as statutes are, and that the law is actually applied in the way the law should be applied, because I do believe in the past it has not been, and obviously this is continuing to go on. Um, this hearing today is noticeable of that. So on your way out, maybe it's the best time to deal with some of those things, because sometimes that's when, the cur that's when we have the courage to do it, but this could very much come up again in the future. Thank you, Congressman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the committee will stand in recess for two minutes. I ask that the members remain here if they can. Do you have to go to the bathroom? Yeah.